Hi, I'm Anna, and if you're new here, welcome to my channel, where we explore folklore, mythology, myths, legends, and fairy tales every week. And if you're a returning subscriber, welcome back. Today we're going to look into the legend of the Bell Witch from Tennessee in the Americas in the 1800s. Let's get started. The Bell Witch is the name given to an entity, a spirit or a demon, that haunted the Bell family from the years of 1817 to 1821, in their home in the town of Adams, in Robertson County, in Tennessee. The family consisted of John Bell Sr., the husband and father of the family, Lucy, his wife, and mother to their six children, Jesse, Richard, John Jr., Drury, Benjamin, and their only daughter, Betsy. Now, when I use the term witch in this video, I don't really mean an old crone hunched over a cauldron like you might be thinking. But in the 1800s, the term witch was often used to describe really anything that was supernatural or unknown, which is the way that it's used in this story. Alongside this, many believed that witches could conjure spirits that would do their bidding, or that witches could separate themselves from their body and appear in spirit form. This is sometimes given as an explanation for the Bell Witch name. Now, the whole ordeal of the Bell Witch haunting started when John Bell was out one day in his cornfields, and he spotted a strange creature. Some say that it was a large black dog, and others say it had the body of a dog and the head of a rabbit. It was thought that as he approached, he tried to identify what it was, but he'd never seen anything like it. He did have his gun with him, and he fired at the creature, and it disappeared right in front of him, into thin air. In the Bell Witch Anthology, the essential text of America's most famous ghost story, by Nick Moretti, this encounter with the strange creature is described. He was confronted by a strange animal, unlike any he had seen sitting in a cornrow, gazing steadfastly at him as he approached near. He concluded it was probably a dog, and having his gun in hand, shot at it, and the animal ran off. It was here that all the trouble of the Bell Witch started. It was said that after this encounter, other members of the family, as well as their slaves and servants that they did keep at the time, saw strange creatures and animals all around the house in similar ways. Their daughter Betsy was also said to have seen a young woman in a beautiful dress wandering around the orchard. She tried to speak to her, but the woman didn't respond, and then, like the strange beast her father had seen, it promptly vanished. Now, after this, the haunting really began. At night, the family started to hear strange tapping on the walls, knocking and rattling, and chewing and scratching beneath their feet. At first, they thought that it was rats. They would jump up and light a candle and try to spot them but there was nothing there whenever they did. Progressively, these sounds got louder and louder, until it sounded like there was a great dog or wolf on the ground right next to them, scratching away at the wooden floorboards. This terrified the children, and I'm sure the parents alike. It wasn't long before these taps and knocks seemed to come across in a somewhat intelligent manner. The young boys in the family decided to play a game and to ask whatever it was knocking or rapping on the walls questions 
and try to get responses. They would have the mysterious knocking, tap once for yes and twice for no, and surprisingly, all of its answers were correct. They would ask it simple questions to try and test it, simple addition or mathematics problems, as well as knocking for how many people were in the house and each time the answers were correct. Well, going on into the late hours of the night and the early morning, the boys were said to play with this entity or spirit that they found in their house. The more they communicated with it, the stronger its presence grew, and it wasn't long until they started to hear a quiet, raspy voice which they couldn't make out at first. With every passing day that they communicated with the entity, its voice grew stronger and stronger, and eventually they were having full-on conversations with it. Not just at night anymore, but too during the day. After some time, the entity's voice took on that of a feminine persona, the Bell Witch. It was said that the first time they asked it a question and got a full detailed response, Richard Bell, one of their sons, told later in his own book that they asked, Who are you and what do you want? The reply came, I am a spirit. I was once very happy but have been disturbed. Strangely, at the time that all of this was happening, John Bell, too, became sick, and his health declined quite rapidly. He had problems chewing and swallowing, and was partially paralysed in his mouth and face. And his facial muscles swelled, and often constricted his movement. The Bell Witch had a much darker side to her, and she wasn't just there to talk. At night, she would scratch and pinch and hit the children, as well as the parents. She would throw off their bed covers and pull their hair, and she especially did this to their daughter, Betsy Bell. Betsy was the worst treated by this entity, and she was often badly abused, hit, scratched, and pricked with what they thought were needles, while she slept, as well as while she was out of the house. For the Bell Witch could seem to go anywhere that she wanted, and she wasn't tied to the house. But we'll get on to that a little more later. They continued to speak to the entity to try and find out what or who it was. And through their many conversations, she gave them very strange answers. One time she said that she was the spirit of a Native American who was buried or whose tooth was buried under their floorboards. Then she was a man who had buried treasure somewhere on the property and she even sent out members of the family to look for it. Eventually, the thing, whatever it was, claimed to be Old Kate Bats. This is the name that stuck. Now, Kate Bats was a local resident, not too far away, who was known to be eccentric and a little bit strange. She took care of her household affairs, as her husband was disabled and needed a lot of care and was immobile. She was a strong woman for all intents and purposes, and she lived a hard life with not a lot of money. However, she was said to act as if she was a member of high society, and she tried to act more fancy or more well-off than she actually was. She was also known to be quite comical and was known well around the town. 
but she wasn't disliked or thought of to be bad or evil in any way. Just a woman that had a difficult life compared to most, especially because of her husband's situation. For some reason, when the entity gave this identity, it stuck. And from then on, they called her Kate, or Kate's Witch. Now, the Bell Witch, or the entity that we call the Bell Witch, formed very different relationships with the different members of the household. She was known to have a great hate for John Bell, the patriarch of the Bell family. She threatened him and cursed at him, and said on multiple occasions that she was going to kill him. His daughter, Betsy, she had a strange interest in, and most of her physical attacks were focused on the young girl, who was about 11 or 12 at the time. And when it came to Betsy, for some reason, she was vehemently against her engagement to her sweetheart, Joshua Gardner. For many years, she told Betsy not to marry him, and though she was quite young, people did get married younger back then. The entity was actually quite fond of Lucy, John's wife, and Betsy's mother. At one time, the Bell Witch even commented that Lucy was the most perfect woman to walk the earth. As well as this, she would often sing for her, or bring her fresh fruit and other gifts. Less attention was given by the witch to the sons of the family, and her main focus was on their only daughter. For whatever reason, we don't know. The whole affair was considered very embarrassing and even shameful to the family, and they kept it secret for a long time. After a while, Lucy Bell, the wife and mother of the family, confided in her good friend, Jane Johnston, about the strange happenings in her home, making her promise not to tell anyone about it for fear that her family would be mocked or scorned. Later, the two of them discussed it with Jane Johnston, her husband, and they invited the couple to stay the night at their house, to experience it for themselves. Now, the area that they lived in was, of course, very Christian, and the Johnstons' family were known to be very religious and well-versed in the Bible, which is one of the reasons why Lucy reached out to them for help in the first place. In an authenticated history of the Bell Witch, author Martin V. Ingram, in 1894, describes their encounter on that strange night that the Johnston family visited. As soon as all were in bed and the lights extinguished, the frightful racket commenced, and presently entered Mr. and Mrs. Johnston's room, with increased demonstrations. Stripping the cover from their bed, Mr. Johnston was astounded and sat upright in bed in wild amazement. But he was a man of strong faith and cool courage. And recovering from the confusion, he collected his wits and commenced talking to the spectre, adjuring it to reveal itself and tell for what purpose it was there. It was said that Mr. Johnston spoke to the spirit for quite some time, and in the morning he described it as like a spirit from in the Bible, and he told them that they should seek help in dealing with the matter. Of course, such a strange story can only be kept secret for so long, and not long after the Bell family had the Johnstons' visit, but they too were visited by other neighbours and strangers alike. Soon, people travelled from far and wide to visit the Bell family home to see the strange witch that many told stories of. And the Bell witch was more than happy to oblige. Some stories tell that when a new person entered the family home, She would announce their arrival, their name, their background, and any scandalous secrets that they may be hiding. 
Who was a drunk? Who was cheating on their wife? Who had a mistress? And who had gambled away their family money? Somehow, the Bell Witch seemed to know all about everyone that she came across, much to their embarrassment in many cases. Not only that, but she, or it, seemed to be able to travel great distances in a matter of seconds, faster than we can travel today. Going from one side of the globe to the other in a matter of minutes to find information and then bring it back and prove itself to the Bell family and their guests. The Bell Witch could also mimic voices perfectly, members of the family and strangers alike. She could copy their voice exactly and speak back to them in their own voice. One interesting story tells of when some Shakers, members of a Christian sect, came down the road towards the Bell family home on their horses, where they would usually eat and be entertained by the family when they were passing through. Lucy Bell was always a gracious host, but on this particular day, she'd had a bit of a bad day, and she'd mumbled to herself a bit about having to entertain guests when she already had so much to do. Not long after, they heard the voice of the boy who lived on the farm and looked after the dogs. And they heard him commanding the dogs to chase the horses off. They looked down the road, and to their surprise, their would-be guest had turned around and taken off down the road, away from the dogs and away from their home. Then it was said that they heard Kate's witch, or the bell witch, laughing throughout the house. Meaning to scold the boy for his behaviour, they went out to find him, only to be informed that he was far, far away in the field, and no way near the house or the dogs of the time. It had been the witch impersonating his voice to help Lucy, who we know that she was fond of, by scaring off their unexpected guests. The Bell Witch was also said to be able to materialise objects, seemingly out of thin air. Everyone would be enjoying themselves sitting about, and she may say, Here, enjoy some grapes, and they would appear up in the air and fall into a person's lap. The Bell Witch could also quote the Bible. Any passage that was asked of it would be recited without hesitation and without fail. When the priests and reverends visited, which they did many times, they would get into arguments or debates with the strange disembodied voice in the house. They often argued about the meaning of certain passages and scripture in the Bible, and the entity would always seem to make a stronger, better argument and beat them in the debates embarrassing the men who had devoted their lives to God. The Bell Witch was also known to have a beautiful singing voice, and she could sing any hymn from the Bible, and she often liked to sing to the mother and wife of the family, Lucy Bell. On one especially strange night, the witch seemed to turn into or be joined by four other spirit voices. It's unknown whether these were four different spirits, or the one entity taking on four different identities simultaneously. The four introduced themselves with strange names. One said their name was Jerusalem, the other Psychography, the other Mathematics, and their apparent leader was called Black Dog. Black Dog was described as having a harsh feminine voice, whereas Psychography and Mathematics also spoke with feminine voices, only softer and gentler. And Jerusalem spoke with the voice of a boy. It was said that on this night, these voices seemed to get drunk and intoxicated. How it's possible for a spirit to get drunk, I don't know. 
but the house was filled with the smell of alcohol. And the four voices claimed to have taken whiskey from John Gardner, a neighbour who lived four miles away. Over time, both during the active haunting, as well as afterwards, people have been sceptical of the whole ordeal of the Bell Witch. At the time, many people aimed to try and prove that it was the family, or even Betsy herself, pulling a great hoax on everyone. However, the people that tried to prove this were often proven wrong. Some say that the whole family was in on a hoax, and others say that it was just Betsy, fooling both her family as well as others. But none of them could explain how fruit and treats could seemingly appear out of nowhere, and no one could prove where on earth the voice came from. Some say that Betsy was using ventriloquism to create the voice, and faking the attacks of the entity. But at the same time, she was only 11 to 12 years old, and there wasn't really any way for her or the other family members to know all of the secrets of the people who visited. After all, the Bell Witch denounced many intimate and embarrassing secrets that no one else knew but them. Not only that, but when Betsy and other members of the family were away, the Bell Witch often remained. There were many who tried to test the witch, thinking that the whole thing was a hoax. The son of the Johnstons, who stayed the night with the family, came up with a question that only a few members of their family knew the answer to. He asked the witch what their Dutch step-grandmother, who lived states away in North Carolina, would say to her slaves if they didn't do something to her liking. The Bell Witch replied with their grandmother's own voice, saying the correct words. Hut tut, what has happened now? Later, an Englishman who was a skeptic visited them, and he stayed with them overnight. In the evening, the entity spoke to him in the voice of both his parents, and later that night, it did so again waking him up. But the voices he heard this time were his mother and father panicking because they had heard his own voice talking to them back in England. Sometime later, the man wrote a letter and apologised to the Bell family for his scepticism. On that same night, he had now found out that his parents had in fact been visited by the witch and heard his voice speaking to them. On the 20th of December, 1820, John Bell passed away. It was said that when John Bell died, his family found a vial that was almost empty nearby the bed. When they fed the remaining contents of it to a cat, it promptly died. And the voice of Kate, the Bell Witch, spoke up and she claimed that she had killed John Bell in the night with poison. Whereas others say that he died of old age or the health complications that he had been facing in the recent years. It was said that at his funeral service, the Bell Witch sang rowdy and crude drinking songs. Eventually, in 1821, Betsy Bell called off her engagement with Joshua. With the engagement ended, and John Bell dead, it announced that it was going to leave, but would return again in seven years. Richard Bell, the son of John and Lucy, who was a child at the time of the haunting, described the experience later on in his life. He said, whether it was witchery, such as afflicted people in past centuries and the darker ages, whether some gifted fiend of hellish nature, practising sorcery for selfish enjoyment, or some more modern science, akin to that of mesmerism, 
or some hobgoblin native to the wilds of the country, or a disembodied soul shut out from heaven, or an evil spirit like those Paul drove out of the man into the swine, setting them mad, or a demon let loose from hell. I am unable to decide nor has anyone yet divined its nature or cause for appearing, and I trust this description of the monster in all forms and shapes, and of many tongues, will lead experts who may come with a wiser generation to a correct conclusion and satisfactory explanation. Richard Williams Bell, An Authenticated History of the Bell Witch. That was today's story of the Bell Witch, the haunting of the Bell family from Robertson County, Tennessee in the 1800s. Now I look forward to seeing you next week for my Halloween special, which will be more of a documentary style video and much longer than usual. But for now, Stay safe, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye! I'd like to take a moment to say a big thank you to the members of the channel, as well as my patrons on Patreon, for supporting my work. Folklore and fairy tales play such a big part in my life, and I love being able to share them here with you. If you're interested in finding out more about channel membership, you can find all the information here or in the link in the video description. Or you can head over to my Patreon page. You can find the link in the description of this video or on my YouTube homepage. Thanks for watching and thanks again to the members of the channel and my patrons for your support. But for now, stay safe and I'll see you in the next video.